Welcome to the Supported Living Property Podcast with your host, me, Lisa Brown, the place to learn about supported living property investing. Thank you um, for joining me today, Michael. It's lovely to have you here. Pleasure, Lisa. I I wonder if you want to tell people a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, sure. I've been involved in supported housing really since the mid-1980s. I was initially a mental health support worker and then specialised in homelessness and mental health, um, sort of in a sort of you know, client facing capacity. And then in the early, uh, late 1980s, um, moved over to directing a small voluntary organisation that was concerned with rehousing people from uh, long stay um, mental health institutions, um, the hospital closure or reprovision programme as it was known. Um, early 1990s, I moved into self-employment. Um, I was, in a sense, uh, interested in the, if this doesn't sound inappropriate, the higher level principles about how supported housing works, how it's funded um, and what it does. So I set up a consultancy um, consultancy brand called Support Solutions, which still exists, so I work separately from it now. Um, I have a a fairly, well, a strong values base really to underpin what I do. One of the um, more recent developments in the way I think was to devise a system for the measurement of quality in supported housing, which I call value generation. Um, And it's got three principles to it. It's what are the outcomes for people? What's the cost benefit to the public purse in this context? And what's the wider social and community benefit? And as well as applying that value generation approach to supported housing, you can apply it to the way that you as a person get involved in supported housing. Are you generating value in what you do? I think one of the problems, and we'll probably talk about this a bit later on, is where's the balance between, um, for example, investors in supported housing investing for profit and for social purpose, because there has to be a balance. I think it's a bit of a skewed one at the moment, perhaps. I think finally, in terms of my own background and where I'm coming from on this, um, I'm a family carer. My my youngest son has got a significant level of additional need. He will need to be in supported housing at some point in his life. He requires one-to-one support. So it kind of makes, he he came on after, he's he's 21. I've been involved in this for heavens, 30 odd years, maybe more now. Um, um, But it very much influences the way I see Um, my involvement in supported housing and the shape that supported housing should be. That's interesting and gives you another perspective to it I guess doesn't it? Yes very much so I mean it's sort of the human perspective it's um, it's obviously important to look at supported housing in terms of how much does it cost what's its quality like you know is it is it reflecting strategic priorities locally and so on but if you've also got an attachment as a family carer with your own flesh and blood it certainly does add an additional dimension. Absolutely. It really makes you focus on on how it could be, I guess. Mm -hmm. Should should we start at the beginning and talk a little bit about the history of supported housing, supported living and kind of where that came from? Because it sounds like you were involved in moving people right from the beginning. So it would be useful to us. It's an interesting one because, um, you know, as as we were discussing, my involvement goes back to the 1980s. But actually supported housing in this country goes back to the medieval era when you think about it. Because, um, you know, if you, if you um, think about almshouses and, um, you know, accommodation for distressed gentlefolk and things like that. So wealthy people would leave bequests in their will, um, you know, so that uh, the, the, the deserving poor, quote unquote, uh, would get a roof over their heads. Um, that, um, and that, and, you know, some of the medieval almshouses exist to this day. And some of the foundations that were both on trusts that were based on Um, bequests still exist to this day. Um, I think it's probably fair to say without being a historian in supported housing per se that um, it received another boost in you know the age of empire um, and um, and the Victorian era where wealthy people who made a a lot of money sometimes ironically through fairly dubious activities associated with slavery ironically um, uh, again bequeathed lots of money and um, uh, set up uh, trusts and accommodation for people. Again, people in necessitous circumstances. Um, you had organisations like the Peabody Trust, which I, has nothing to do with uh, what I've just mentioned in terms of slavery and money that came from that. Um, I hasten to add, 
Um, but that was set up in, in the Victorian era in London. Um, again, um, as I understand it, Peabody set up for people who were working, but on low incomes. And it's a sort of almost the first form of social housing rather than necessarily supported housing. But it's, it's very much a similar thing. Um, and it's been going on ever since. I mean, um, last four to five years, we've seen a significant growth in specialised supported housing, which um, probably want to talk about a bit later on. Mm. Um, the Community Care Acts in the 1980s um, led to um, taking the focus rightly uh, away from hospitals and institutional forms of, of care into sort of community care, the backbone of which, of course, is supported housing. Absolutely. And your experience then when you got involved in it, what, what was your experiences from there? In terms of hospital reprovision and, and care yeah. and community? Yeah. Well, at the time, people were very worried about it with good reason, because um, as with many politically driven initiatives, at the bottom of it is, can we save some money here? Um, from my perspective, the, the departure from the sort of institutional model, particularly the long stay hospitals for people with mental health needs and learning disabilities, absolutely essential. Very, very much um, uh, a discredited model. Um, uh, it was interesting at the time um, that there was, well, how can I put it? A fair bit of tension, shall we say, between the advocates of, of community care and supported housing like myself and clinical teams in hospitals who were convinced that we'd be completely overrun by these, these people who were completely institutionalized would never survive outside of a, an institutional environment because that's what they were used to. Mm. And I think that, you know, his, recent history tells us that supported housing is by far and away a better option for people with a, a, even a very, very high level of, of significant need. And it's a good thing too. It also does happen to be a lot cheaper <laughs> than the institutions. <laughs> Um, and I think, I mean, supported housing has moved the focus away from a sort of medical um, stroke clinical model of quote unquote disability to a more social one, um, you know, based on things like John O'Brien's five accomplishments, which I won't trouble you with at the moment, but it was an, an underpinning, of course, for you know, the fact that people should have community presence, they should have a, a right to um, access and be part of a community. And that's very much for me what supported housing is, is about. It's not a something that operates in, in isolation from the communities within which it's, uh, it's developed. No, absolutely. It's about people being integrated into the society mm. and all yeah. of us working together for that. Um, obviously, that leads us nicely onto kind of where we are currently with specialist supported housing and kind of current trends in, in that. Um, where do you see where we are now? Well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. Specialised supported housing is a particular model. Um, as people know, just know, kind of clarify what that is for people. Yes, I was going to give a definition of it. I mean, it's a definition that's been around for a while, but it's been given a new lease of life, um, not least as a consequence of stuff that I put in the public domain. Um, but it's defined by three things. People who live in specialised supported housing should otherwise be in need of registered care or institutional hospital care, which is an interesting connection to the whole um, care in the community thing. Secondly, it has to be funded by private capital. And thirdly, it needs to be developed in conjunction with the strategic priorities of local commissions, so the NHS and local authorities, which is a very significant thing. The UK government made a, an addition to the definition more recently, which also said there has to be a housing association involved as landlord, because obviously specialised supported housing is funded in great part by enhanced housing benefit. And if no housing association is involved in landlord, local authorities who pay that enhanced housing benefit can't fully reclaim it. Yeah. So those, those are the criteria for specialised supported housing. Um, the UK government's, and, and it, it, it's a concept that applies to England rather than UK wide. There was nothing to stop it as a model being used in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. But the UK government brought it to the fore, I think, because it struggles with allocating capital for the development of good quality supported housing and it's mindful of the fact that there are an increasing number of people not just older people of course um, who have a high level of additional need so they need quite a bit of, of support um, and intensive housing management 
hence that model. And they had conversations some years ago with the pension funds specifically to say, look, you guys, the pension funds and your agents are struggling perhaps to get the returns you need for your pensioners. So if you invest in specialised supported housing for a single digit revenue return, you know, six, seven percent of public money, we'll give you the capital, or sorry, we'll give you the revenue if you give us the capital or you give the sector the capital. Um, and I remember um, writing a briefing a few years back on specialised supported housing for the sector, which was picked up very quickly by some of the institutional investors. And since then, um, we've had a significant amount of development of specialised supported housing. Not all of it terribly well done, I have to say, in terms of um, not necessarily the product, though you know, the product does depend on how well you've negotiated its presence with commissioners amongst others and, and how well the, the finances have been stacked up. Um, but specialised supported housing is, is being developed at a, a rate of knots at the moment. I think one of the important things is, again, we may talk about is making sure it's done properly. And by that, I mean, one of the definitions, one of the criteria to define it is, must be developed in accordance with local strategic priorities. And um, without a conversation with local commissioners, um, the concept of specialised supported housing becomes a problem. And one of the other issues that concerns me at the moment really is that um, many investors, not all by any stretch of the imagination, um, I couldn't give a percentage, but too large a number of investors have perhaps got more focus on the percentage than they have on the social impact. And we're in a process of evolution at the moment to get to the model that balances um, a percentage return for investment with a social interest. You know, how effective is this at meeting high levels of need? And gets that balance right between being a sensible business return, but also meets the ethical standards. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think that um, at the moment, there's quite a lot of focus on how not to do, how not to do it, because there are too many examples of um, badly planned specialised supported housing. And what I mean by this is um, developers and investors um, almost chucking up buildings without thinking through who's this for, right? Without talking to the NHS and local authorities to say, look, guys. What are your strategic priorities? Are we talking mental health? Are we talking older people? Are we talking substance misuse? Are we talking learning disability? Are we talking physical disability, for example? And, and, and how would you want to see this configured? How would you want to see it run? Where would you want the buildings to be? All of those things are really important. And without those, um, uh, those conversations, it becomes a problem. And I'm aware of, of too many um, buildings that accommodate a perhaps inappropriate mix of people in inappropriate places um, where uh, too small a percentage of the revenue from enhanced housing benefits is allocated to the operation of the scheme and too much of it is allocated to shareholders um, of the investing agency. And that's something that we need to keep a, a strong eye on. It's something I informally campaign about um, through the blog posts that I do and the briefings that I put out and things like this, for example. And, and it's really important, I think, to raise awareness of that, isn't it? Because it, it has been a historic problem, hasn't it? It is. It's been a historic problem. And I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, people who, who would live in specialised supported housing, remember, these are people who would otherwise need hospital or registered care, have a high level of need. So it's incredibly important there is good levels of resource to meet those needs within the buildings. Um, I think also that um, to some extent it, it sort of resembles the Wild West in terms of you know sort of a, a gold rush because I think some um, individuals see this as an opportunity to make money now, not just investors um, but there are also people setting up housing associations at least that's what they theoretically are whose sole purpose is to take a legal interest a, sorry, a legal interest in um, a property in order to enable enhanced housing benefit to be paid. Um, and there is a shortage of, of regulation and oversight 
on all forms of supported housing, actually. Mm. Specialised supported housing is a case in point. Who regulates it? Who oversees it? I mean, there are a number of different regulators in the sector. We're talking about the English situation where, uh, rather than the UK-wide situation, where specialised supported housing is a thing. Mm. You've got the regulator of social housing, um, which regulates social housing very well. How, how well it regulates supported housing is perhaps another matter. You've got the Charities Commission, um, because not all supported housing providers are housing associations. And you've got the FCA, um, ironically, um, which also regulates uh, voluntary organisations or some voluntary organisations, but what grasp do they have of supported housing? It's not their main business, it's not their main activity, and that can be a problem. There's also a distinction, of course, between regulation on the one hand and oversight on the other. Who oversees it? as opposed to regulates. In other words, what's done within it, who oversees the quality of that? In theory, local authorities. And the UK government has um, issued some new guide guidance, but it is only guidance, there isn't any money attached to it, called the National Statement of Expectations for Supported Housing. That came out on the 20th of October, you know, just a month ago. Um, it, it's disappointing, unfortunately, because it's a statement of wish list and it, it doesn't give resources to enable local authorities to oversee things effectively. So it's, it's a, a bit of a worrying situation, I think. Um, you know, we, we need to have a coming, of ter you know, um, how can I put it? Um, a coming to terms um, with the fact of specialised supporting housing, which is a good thing in and of its own right. But actually, if we look back at value generation, what's the impact on, the, on people who live in it? What's the cost benefits of the public first? What's the wider social and community benefit? If we use those three criteria, which I call value generation, to assess the quality of something, whether it's in its operation or in its development, we should be on safe ground. It, you know, at the end of the day, um, let's get that balance between um, profit and social concern right. And it's not right at the moment in many cases. Would you propose there should be a separate regulator looking speci specifically at specialised supported housing? Well, um, it's an interesting question, really. Um, I, I would like there to be one, but I suspect that's going to be difficult because, um, you, you know, when you think of the agencies involved, housing associations as landlords and as providers, charities and voluntary organisations all have their own regulators. And, and I think perhaps... Uh, the, the better approach would be to get those regulators to specialise better in the regulation of supported housing would be a good thing. It's the oversight for me that really matters. Um, because I think the regulation in many ways, there is infrastructure that just needs to be adjusted to take account of the special, um, how can I put it, circumstances, if you like, of supported housing. But it's the oversight that's really important. And what I'm concerned to see is um, systems of oversight quality, really, you know, developed by uh, independent organisations, and I would suggest universities with a good social research track record, should be tasked with, or think tanks, should be tasked with the development of an oversight framework which has national scope. And furthermore, I think they should actually carry out the oversight function themselves because they're separate from commissioners and funders and from providers and one of the problems we have at the moment with um to the extent to which we have those oversight at all is you can't separate it from funding and if you can't separate it from funding that is going to compromise the oversight function so i'd rather see a university or a think tank develop a framework for oversight implement it nationally and operate it as well in conjunction with commissioners and in conjunction with providers in terms of, of working with them in its implementation but not necessarily well how can I put it it has to be done independently so the outcome so the judgments that are made are made by the organization that actually undertakes the oversight itself I, and I, I, I think it's incredibly important that it remains independent from funders and providers in terms of its implementation, if not its development. Where do you see things like CQC and Ofsted sitting? Do you see them sitting alongside that, that regulation or do you see? Um, I don't, I have to say. Mm. Um, I, I think that um, 
when you look at organizations um, that provide supported housing, what, who regulates them? So if we, if we maintain the distinction between regulation on the one hand and oversight on the other, um, if we have the regulator of social housing perhaps redefining the scope of its regulatory um, handle on supported housing, the same with the Charities Commission, whether or not the FCA is going to be up to that, I don't really know. Um, that's what I would rather see. And CQC, for example, has got a, a very different record. Um, and uh, then again, moving on to the issue of oversight, as I mentioned before, I, I think it has to be done entirely separately from the financial interest and the service delivery interest because they, you know, in a constructive way, they need to be held to account in a way. Mm -hmm. to but CQC, so yeah, yes, that's right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and from um, that kind of leads into the funding stuff that you've kind of alluded to a little bit and, and where funding currently is and trends in that. I know that's something you also write about, Michael. Yeah, I mean, obviously we've got capital and we've got revenue. Um, as we discussed a bit earlier on, on the capital side, um, there's been a significant reduction in public capital. For the Perhaps it would be useful for just to really define what you mean by those for some of the listeners who might be a bit okay. unclear about that. Well, um, the, the, the regulator for social housing in previous incarnations used to fund the development of, of a lot of the supported housing that we have um, by what was known as housing association grant that then became social housing grant. And this is public grant funded through a, a government quango known previously as the housing corporation and currently as the regulator for social housing um, in terms of its development. But that's... Um, with the exception of some one-off pots of money, particularly those focused around homelessness and mental health, which the government still, the UK government still provides one-off pots of money that people can access to develop schemes. Um, aside from that, really, it's tailed off quite significantly in favour of um, private capital. Um, and that's where we are now, not just for specialised supported housing, but for particularly for specialised supported housing. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, specialised supported housing, the rents aren't capped on it. So actually you can get quite a lot of money from what we call enhanced housing benefit, that the revenue stream. So if, if, an investor who puts in capital to develop specialised supported housing can expect to see quite significant levels of revenue coming through the enhanced housing benefit route. And that will provide sufficient revenue for both repayment of capital and for the operation of the scheme in theory and usually in practice. And that's also, I mean, the reason it was developed was to um, make take account of the fact that some of these properties need to be highly adapted, that they may need a lot more space, all of the things that are different yeah. rather than maybe someone who, with general needs and their housing requirements. Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. And I mean, um, uh, and it's a good thing too. I mean, moving away from the specialised supported housing model, we have what you might call traditional supported housing, that's probably not a particularly meaningful term, but non-specialised mm. supported housing. That still has, that's still entitled to significant level, it's not uh, of, um, of enhanced housing benefit. Um, the difference between specialised supported housing and traditional supported housing in this context is that the, the core rent, the bricks and mortar costs of specialised supported housing are not restricted um, by regulation. Traditional supported housing separately, the core rent costs, the bricks and mortar costs are, because you can only charge, um, if, if we're talking about social supported housing, which is what we are talking about, um, you can only effectively charge local housing announced levels plus or minus 10% on the core rent component of the rent. But the service charge component, the sorts of activities and facilities that people with additional needs require is not restricted in either model, specialised supported housing or so-called traditional supported housing. Um, there is a, um, a much higher rate, potentially, of enhanced housing benefit payable to any form of supported housing on the service charge side. Um, and that, that's one of the things that I suppose that um, I was uh, at least in part responsible for was identifying the fact that this thing called enhanced housing benefit exists. This was going back to 2005 with the retrenchment of what 
was known at the time as supporting people funding. We were very keen to ensure that providers of supported housing didn't lose revenue because the government was cutting back on supporting people. Mm. And we identified a route um, called the exempt accommodation rules, which enabled people to claim enhanced housing benefit. And the rest is history. Most supported housing providers now have enhanced housing benefit as their primary revenue stream. It's a very, very important um, pot of money. Uh, right. Nobody knows how much is paid per year, not even the DWP. I don't think well, okay. No, that's true. I mean, they, they, you know, about four billion quid a year in housing benefit gets paid to supported housing, but nobody knows what proportion of that is enhanced housing benefit. Okay. But I mean, it's been really, really key, hasn't it, to the sustainability in the sector and to people providing oh, properties. Ab know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it was interesting because when we first uh, raised the prospect of this, people thought, well, where's the catch? It must be something dodgy about this. Mm. Well, clearly not. I mean, it's a, it is now a well-worn regulatory route, um, its enhanced housing benefit. The key question, of course, is, you know, how long will it last? And people have been saying since 2005, oh, don't get involved in enhanced housing benefit, it'll disappear one day. Well, you know, we're in 2020, coming on 2021, it's still with us. Yes. Um, you know, we, we've had universal credit since, which was meant to absorb housing benefit as one of six benefits that it absorbed. Well, housing benefit still exists in the form of enhanced housing benefit for supported housing. Will it continue to exist? Um, good question. Um, the UK government came up with a set of proposals for the future funding of supported housing back in 2018. It wasn't a terribly successful set of proposals, I must confess, and they've left it in abeyance ever since. What they have done um, since 2018 is to confirm that actually revenue for supported housing will remain within the welfare benefit system. Right. So currently it's within housing benefit. Question is, will it go into universal credit as a perhaps, you know, universal credit has a housing component but it's a restricted one based on LHA levels at the moment. But for supported housing, um, should we have a, a, an expandable housing component for universal credit? Because if someone comes into supported housing at the moment, they're likely to be on universal credit. Um, when they apply for universal credit online, there's a box that says, are you in supported housing? If you tick that box, the housing component of your universal credit claim is administered by housing benefit, not by universal credit. Okay. And it, so is, is that what we're going to have as a continuing transitional mechanism or is it going to go into universal credit as a sort of expandable housing component because the cost, the housing costs of supported housing are clearly much higher than um, those of general needs. Mm. And obviously the concern is with any changes like that, that it may restrict funding for people for, for future and may, may impact on the quality of accommodation people can have. Do you see that? I think that's right, yes. I mean, I think that whilst we still have these... Um, infuriating treasury green book rules that try and you know reduce cost at source so to speak um you're always going to have that pressure it's you're never going to see a situation where the government says oh well let's increase the housing component <laughs> you know <laughs> the housing benefit or let's have a housing component and universal credit and let's leave it uncapped um again i go back to value generation but we've got to look at you know does supported housing generate value if you invest money in supported housing you're going to get an awful lot more back in terms of, of, of savings. You know, if we don't invest in preventative services like supported housing, we end up getting situations where otherwise avoidable crises occur and you know, people have to be picked up off the streets and taken to hospital, you know, placements break down, all that sort of thing. So it's actually really important that the government... Sorry, I think it's really important for people to understand that although supported living schemes look quite expensive, you know, you've got one person living there with 24 hour care, that's still much, much cheaper than, than being in a residential setting, isn't it? All the Absolutely, or, or even a medium secure unit. I mean, you can see um, quite significantly high claims for um, housing benefit, for supported housing of various different types. But it's you always, always, always infinitely cheaper, than, well, infinitely, much, much cheaper than the alternative, mm. even though it might look like a lot of money. I mean, medium secure units, what, three, three and a half, four thousand pounds a week? You know, high, so-called high rents for supported housing would be a few hundred, mm. plus perhaps a bit of top up from the local authority, but nothing like the costs of, of institutional care and, and with much better outcomes. Absolutely. And the quality mm. and the personalised care that's provided is very good. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So for the future, obviously, from that point of view, do you see, like we're also talking about the sort of investment into the sector and where that, that funding's coming from currently, um, 
there's a lot of interest in supportive housing at the moment. I think, you know, that was one of the reasons we're talking about it now is that, you know, smaller, more individualized per property investors are looking at supported housing as a, as a different model for investing. Um, mm. And I, but I know that there's also sort of the bigger institutional funds are also, um, they're still allocating large amounts of money, aren't they, towards supported housing? They are. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's interesting, really, because um, I mean, I couldn't give you numbers, um, but it seems to me to be the case anecdotally that, um, you know, we, we, we've got a, a huge sort of surge of investment interest in this, um, which, you know, in, in principle is a good thing. Um, I go back again a bit like a crack record to the whole issue of value generation, the need to balance the percentage return with um, um, the social purpose. Um, and I think that, um, how can I put it? Um, one of the problems that's cropped up, of course, is that um, people seeing it simply as a means of getting a good return. I mean, sure, it'll give you a good return um, in theory, um, if you just go ahead and develop um, um, accommodation. But if it's done um, separately from what's strategically important at local level. And I, I, you know, I accept that local authorities in the NHS are not always easy to deal with. Um, but actually, we have to be very, very persistent. It's good news for them if we can get our, fit, our foot through the door to say to them, look, you know, you've got problems with so-called bed blocking, you've got issues with homelessness, you've got all these problems that present at local level, whether it's a social or a medical issue. Um, in terms of its presentation, this is genuinely a solution. Um, but the, the, the construction, the development rather, of any form of supported housing must be done in conjunction with those commissioners because um, for better or for worse, they're the ones who um, have the say in what's important locally. They're the ones that have done the research on what's important locally. Um, and if it's done with them, um, Obviously, what you're doing is coordinating the revenue, which will come from a local authority, and they may be far less willing to pay it um, if it's not been properly commissioned, and quite rightly so in many ways. Mm. Um, it may well be the case that you'll end up with a bit of a white elephant if you've not thought through what needs you're seeking to meet, because you'll end up with a building with too many voids, or you'll end up with a building that's got an unsatisfactory mix of people in it mm. whose needs are not compatible with each other. Um, and I think that um, one of the issues that needs to be addressed in talking with commissioners is, well, what is the balance between profit and, and social return, you know, financial and social return? Um, I'd go so far as to say that if you're going beyond single figure digit percentage return on investment, you're probably going too far beyond, you're going away from the social return and towards the percentage return. It won't last. Because at the end of the day, if we get to a situation where there is a, um, a critical mass of social investors who say, look, we can do a good job here, get good outcomes for people, and actually get a comfortable return financially as well, then those schemes that are put together with the balance skewed towards retur financial return rather than social return are, are going to sort of disappear from view or have to be sold on to someone who's going to use it properly, if indeed it can be used properly, if it's not been developed in conjunction with those who know how to do it. And I think that's another point. Um, anyone can put a building up in a way. Um, not everybody can put up a building and construct it internally in such a way as to meet need. So specialist, you know, specialist developers are really important in, in this particular equation. Hmm. And it's about sustainability, isn't it? That's the key to what you're saying there as well, is being sustainable for everybody involved in the situation and that not one... Uh -huh. A big absolutely and it, it is and i mean you know another factor is to what extent can you have a building that's reconfigurable because when people's needs change or social needs change i mean you're not going to abandon a building or knock it down and build up another one are you i mean no. maybe you are but you probably shouldn't <laughs> um to what extent can it be reconfigurable in terms of the design brief it's an important point it's getting that balance so you've got other exits you know i bang on about that anyone who hears me for five minutes will know that i bang on about you know alternate exits yes supported living is a great exit for a building but mm. unless you're doing something highly highly specialized for, for a very very bespoke scheme generally making sure you've got other exits is important you know like you say sure. reconfigured you know 
um, I think. Is. Um, what would any tips that you'd have, any advice you'd have for um, property investors considering supported living? Well, in a, in a way, we've um, we've sort of talked about some of them. Um, getting the right balance between profit and social mission. Be diligent about who you work with. Um, you know, there are some poorly motivated people out there. Um, there is a distinction, I and mean, this might be a statement of the blindingly obvious, but there's a distinction between developing a building on the one hand and developing supported housing on another. So in terms of, of your design um, brief, do you, do you, um, are you able to design a building that meets needs? Um, you know, I've been talking recently to a couple of specialist property developers who, you know, major on, on specific designs for specific client groups and they're, they're gold dust, I would say. Um, in terms of the development process, are you developing in conjunction with local commissioners? Have you researched what strategic priorities there are? Because um, those are incredibly important. Um, have you looked at, um, how can I put it, financial optimization on the revenue side? So for example, um, the the rules around enhanced housing benefit are imperfect, to put it mildly, but one of the things that's really important is, um, have you got a housing association on board as the landlord? Mm. They don't have to own the property, but they might well be required to lease it from you, because if they do, and they become the landlord as a consequence, it means the local authority can fully reclaim enhanced housing benefit. If you don't have a housing association on board as landlord, the best the local authority can do is to reclaim 60% of the difference between the local housing allowance level and the rent that you're charging. Mm -hmm. And that's likely to make them nervous about agreeing to your, your rent structures. Um, talking of rent structures, um, when you're talking to local authority um, colleagues, the housing benefit department is distinctly different from the commissioning department. So have you got a pre-approval? You know, one of the things that came out in this national statement of expectations for supported housing, one of the few good things, frankly, um, in that document was that the UK government was saying we want commissioners and revenues and benefits teams to work together in the approval of, of new claims. And so they should, mm -hmm. both so that they do approve claims that commissioners, for, for schemes that commissioners want to see, and secondly, that they don't approve claims for supported housing schemes that have been chucked up somewhere because someone wants to make a fast buck on them though that does happen unfortunately so um, as well as talking to commissioners talk to housing benefit colleagues to say look guys these are the sorts of rents we're thinking of charging and these are the sorts of outcomes we're thinking of that, that we want to achieve with this supported housing what do you think yeah. um, because a recent history of supported housing is unfortunately um, littered with examples where organizations as a whole as well as schemes individually have come to grief because um, people didn't get revenue approvals before they committed to building things and that, that is a, a bit of a, a fall at the first hurdle if I may say so. Certainly though if you're working with some of the more established housing associations in this space and the, the established care providers they'll often do some of that legwork for you as the property investor when it depends on the size of this the scheme yes. and the kind of project that you're doing but I think you know if you're looking at smaller individualized properties and schemes often that will have been done on your behalf by the housing association they'll do that liaison with the local authority and well they certainly should I mean but it's worth also making the point that um you know not all housing associations I mean housing associations like the regulator the regulator generally deals with social housing mm. not especially yeah. it does, it's meant to regulate supported housing it does to a degree but not a knowledgeable one yeah. There are housing associations who know their onions on supported housing, and there are housing associations who really don't. And even those who know what they're talking about can be rather risk averse. Mm. So it, what I found ironically in, in, in my attempts to aggregate, um, what, I, what I mean is bring together parties, um, stakeholders in supported housing, you know, developers, uh, investors, commissioners, housing associations and providers if they're separate from housing associations is one of the most difficult parties to nail down is a housing association mm. um, and the role of the housing association needs to change a bit in terms of giving the provider if it's a separate organization which it often is rather more leeway than they currently do mm. um, because it for me the role of a housing association a regulated body 
is to make sure the property is up to scratch in terms of its physical standards and to make sure that the occupancy agreements are properly administered. Above and beyond that, if they're not the provider, they don't really need to do much more. But to try and get them to understand that's a difficult one. Mm. So, I, I, you know, and I think that's a, a, um, one of the issues that people need to think about in development of support housing is which housing association do we use? There are some with a good track record. There are a lot also um, of more recent housing associations that have been set up purely for the purpose of taking legal interests in supported housing. Good model, but unfortunately also open to abuse, as history has recently told us. Absolutely. Michael, thank you. That's been really, really helpful. A really, really useful deep dive into a lot of the background in supported housing and where we're going with things. So thank you for your time today. Thank Many you. thanks indeed, Lisa. Take care.